Welcome to Highline BI348 class video number 23. And if you want to download this workbook, BI348 Chapter 2 Start or the finished file, click on the link below the video. In this video, we got to talk about variation. Now, what's variation? Well, it's going to be closely related to the mean calculation. And here's our example. We have two companies, Bandersons and Plywood and Floor. Our company makes boomerangs, and we order custom aircraft birch plywood from each one of these companies. Here's the last 20 orders, and this is a column of number of days it took for Bandersons to get the shipment to us. Here's a column, number of days for each one of the orders that plywood and floor took to get the custom order to us. But look at this. The average is 9 for Bandersons and for plywood and floor. How in the world do we decide which supplier we might like to choose going forward? Well, which one's more reliable? In order to answer that, we have to figure out which mean more fairly represents its data points. Now, here's a great visual over here. The red one, that's the mean for plywood and floor. And this is the mean for Bandersons. That means on this axis here, this is number of days. Here's the mean. Here's all the data points. Here's the mean. Here's all the data points. It definitely looks like for Banderson that the data points are more spread out, more dispersed. Now, you can imagine from a planning point of view, here's one shipment that came within four days. Here's a shipment over here that came within 16 days. Well, if we were going off the average, right, and we had planned for this to come in nine days and it comes four days early, our manufacturing facility might not be ready to receive that. Whereas here, if we were planning on getting it at day nine and it comes on day 16, well, that's long past when we were planning to use that wood. So we would like a measure that could tell us the dispersion in data sets. Now, the calculation we're going to use is called standard deviation. And the essence of a standard deviation is going to look at the deviation between the mean and each one of its data points. So you could imagine if I took 4, the particular value in this case, minus 9, I would get minus 5. That means a deviation for this particular value from the mean of minus 5. Up here, this would be 16 minus 9, so it would be a deviation of plus 7. So if we could take all of those deviations and use them in a calculation to measure variation or dispersion, that's what we want to do. And our calculation is standard deviation. And we're going to go over to the sheet SD and calculate standard deviation for Bandersons, days for shipment, and plywood and floor. Now, the base calculation is the deviation. So we're going to take the particular value minus, and we've already I've already calculated mean, the count, and count minus 1 up here. I have to lock this with F4, Control-Enter and copy it down. Now, what we'd like to do is simply just add them up and divide by the count to get a type of average for our deviations. But we can't do that, and here's why. If I add up all the deviations, Alt equals, I'm always going to get 0. And that always will be the case. If we come over here to plywood and floor equals that first particular value minus the mean of 9, F4 to lock it, Control-Enter, and copy it down. Come down to the bottom. This is a completely different set of deviations. Alt equals, it's still 0. Anytime you have a set of data points, you calculate the mean, subtract it from each one to get your deviations and add them, you're always going to get 0. So there's actually a couple ways we could deal with this. We could actually as in our standard deviation formula, we could square them to get rid of the minuses and then do the rest of this calculation here. Or there's a separate calculation where we take the absolute value. Standard deviation is the most common calculation, and so that's the one we're going to do. Notice we're going to take each deviation, square it, add them all up, 
divide by n minus 1, and the inside part under the square root sign, that's called variance. And that's a measure of variation also. But square root, that will give us our standard deviation. And we're using a little s here because this is sample data. So little s represents sample standard deviation. All right, so we're going to take our deviation and square it. Control Enter. Now remember that we squared all these. That's in essence why at the end we have to take the square root to undo the square. So our mechanism for getting around that 0 was squaring, but in the end we take the square root to undo it. Now we've squared all of the deviations. That's that part. The summation sign means we need to Alt equals and add them all up. So 182, that's the numerator here. Now let's do this for plywood and floor equals deviation caret 2, Control Enter, copy it down. Now we can add this up, Alt equals, Control Enter, and that 20 for plywood and floor, that's the numerator there. Now I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Sample variance is represented with s squared, so I'm going to take the sum of all the deviations squared and divide it by our n minus 1. Control Enter. That's sample variance. Now we went ahead and went through longhand how to calculate this. So we could sort of see, hey, there's a 0. We had to do something about it. We got around it by squaring it. But in essence, we did it longhand so we could see it's, it's a type of average of all of these deviations. But of course, there is a built-in function. So for variance equals var, and p is for population, dot s is for sample. I'm simply going to tab and highlight the actual values. Control Enter gives me the exact same number. Now here, we squared it to get around that 0. So we're going to do the square root now equals sqrt for square root. And I'm going to take the square root of the variance, and boom, there's our standard deviation. Of course, there's a built-in function, stdev, and there's a p for population, and s for sample. We go to our source data, and that's how we're going to do it moving forward in the class. We simply use the standard deviation for the sample function, and we get 3.61. Now what that means is that Banderson has, on average, a deviation of 3.61 days. Now let's do our calculations over here for plywood and floor. The sum of all the deviations squared divided by n minus 1. There's our variation. We can use var.s, source data, and Enter. We get exactly the same. We take our variance, and we use the square root function. It's perfectly all right to caret and take the exponent of 1 divided by 2, which is the same as taking the square root. But you got to be sure and put 1 divided by 2 in parentheses to force the division before the exponent. Boom, I'm going to get 1.2. If we use our stdev.s function, we take our source data. And Enter, we get 1.2. And boom, there we go. The more reliable supplier is plywood and floor. On average, they have a deviation of 1.2 days. On average, Banderson has a deviation of 3.61. We are using the numerical measure, standard deviation of the sample, to measure variation to make a business decision. All right, now we want to go look at one last example on the sheet, variability. Now, actually, this data set here, it goes from row 20 down to 755. And this is 10-year US government bond yields. And there's a huge range of values in here. You can imagine if you go from 1953 to uh, 2014. And we want to calculate a few measures of variation. Now, we can simply say, hey, look, what's the max in here? And I'm betting it's somewhere in the late 70s or 80s. It was terribly high back then. 15.32% was the return on a 10-year US government bond. Now, the min, 
that's probably somewhere in the more modern era. In particular, I bet it's right about the financial crisis era, 2008 to 10. And let's see, uh, 1.53. Now, we can't see those. You could actually highlight all these and right click unhide and try and find them. But wow, that is a huge spread. So using the max and the min, we can get an idea of variation, right? But it's only using two numbers. As we saw just in our last example, the standard deviation, however, uses all of the data points. Now our sample size equals count, because we're counting numbers. And notice, I have those rows hidden. But when I go from 2 to 755, it's also highlighting all those hidden numbers and cells. Enter. So we had 736 equals n minus 1. And we can calculate our average. And wow, when I highlight from 20 all to way down to row 755, that's spanning the years 53 to 2014. So the average is 6.07. And as we mentioned, the range is simply whatever the max is minus the min. That is a blunt measure of dispersion. Now, sample variance, we use var dot s. And I'm going to highlight. Broop. And so remember, that is before we do the square root. And actually, because we squared our units, we actually have a problem with squared units for this particular measure here. A lot of times, we use standard deviation instead. But we will see some important calculations later in this class where variation is the preferred measure for variation, our standard deviation equals stdev dot s, highlight. And there we have 2.7. So the standard deviation for this huge period is, on average, the deviation is 2.71 percentage points. Now, standard deviation variance and range are all measures of variations. There's another measure of variation that's pretty important, coefficient of variance. And it's important because we'll take standard deviation and divide it by mean, which will mean it gives us standard deviation per one unit of mean. And this is good when you're comparing variances from different distributions particularly when the means are really far apart or the units are different. So I could, in this case, take the standard deviation and I want to express it in terms of units of mean. That means, in our case, for every one percentage point, the variance would be 0.45. Still, another measure for variation is z-score. And we did a lot with z-scores in the prereq class, Business 210. But here's a particular value from this government bond data set, 10.37. If I were to take the deviation, which is the particular value, and subtract the mean, Right there, that gives me the deviation. So this particular one was 4.29 above the mean. But now I want to take that particular deviation and describe it in terms of number of standard deviations. So when I divide it by number of standard deviations, the z will always tell us number of standard deviations a particular value is away from the mean. And we remember from our prereq that we use this all the time, especially with our normal curve. Here, 15.32, that was the max value. I want to figure out how many standard deviations this is above the mean. So equals, in parentheses, particular value. We subtract the mean, and we divide it by our standard deviation. And boom. 3.3 standard deviations above because it's positive. Now, we remember from our study, one way to measure outliers, extreme values, is the 3 z-score rule. If this were a normally distributed distribution and we'd have to plot it and, and look, finding a value that is 3 standard deviations away has a probability that is incredibly small. So that's why the z-score of three z's is used sometimes to identify outliers. Now, just a couple other things that are uh, not paramount to this video. But if we needed to calculate the standard deviation longhand, we don't have to do it in two columns. I can simply say equals whatever the deviation is particular value. 
subtract the mean F4, and then caret 2. I copy that down. This is just deviation squared. That total right there can be then used. Remember, the variance is the inside here. So I take, boom, the total all of the deviation squared divided by n minus 1. That would give me variation, F2. And then I could take the square root to get my standard deviation. Another thing is, last chapter we learned about the index and match functions. Well, notice we have a huge column here, and we calculated the min and the max. Well, notice we have some dates here. So we could use index and match functions to look up 15.32, find the relative position amongst the rates, and then return the date. Now, lookup functions in Excel cannot handle duplicates. So if there is a duplicate, it'll only find the first one. But let's go ahead and remind ourselves from last chapter. Index, the array, those are the values you want to go and get and bring back to the cell. I'm going to hit F4 to lock this, because I am going to copy this down, comma, and then I need the relative position or row number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 5, all the way down to 736, it looks like there are. So I use match. Match is a lookup function that can look up a value, comma, amongst a bunch of values. So we're looking up 15.32. And match is going to look through here and tell us what position it is. And I need to lock that F4, comma, and we're doing exact match, because those values are not sorted. Close parentheses, close parentheses. Again, lookup functions only find the first match. If there are duplicates, it'll only tell us the first date it found. And sure enough, luckily, we're Excel pros, and we know that's a serial number. So we simply have to format it as a date. And there it is, 9-1-1981. When I copy this down, Boom, 7-1-2012. So that was a few years after the, the real heart of the financial crisis. But in the 70s, there was a lot of inflation, which led to really high interest rates. And then after the financial crisis, the Fed brought the, the rates down to 0, and all the other related rates were very low. All right, so in this video, we had a little fun at the end with index and match, but the main point was variation. Well, in this sheet, we saw z-score is a very important measure of variation. We saw a coefficient of variance if you have especially means that are far apart or different units. We saw standard deviation, variation, and range. Back on SD, we saw the two suppliers, and we did standard deviation longhand. And then, of course, this awesome chart to introduce the idea of spread in the data and using the standard deviation as a measure of how reliable a particular mean is. All right, next video, we'll actually talk about mean, standard deviation, Z, and the bell curve and the empirical rule. All right, we'll see you next video.